Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for coming to our HubSpot event. This is all about video production. So we're going to be speaking to a lot of equipment, camera gear, audio gear, uh, lighting equipment, things like that, and then everything that we want to think about while recording, right? So this is production. We did last quarter, we did a hug all about pre-production, and then in the coming months, we're going to do another one in Q4 about post-production. So I think we have some links and registrations. So we'll go ahead and put that in the chat. Make sure you head over there and register for a post-production uh, presentation so you don't miss the, the entire story here. So like I was saying, go ahead and tell us in the chat who you are, where you're from, any questions you might have throughout this presentation. We'll go ahead and touch base at the end during our Q&A about that. We'll hop into introductions here. My name is Aaron Oberdick, and I'm the video marketing manager here at Next Sydney Marketing. We we do a lot of different video uh, things. We we do video production. We we record videos for all of our clients. We also do a lot of animation videos and just behind the scenes work of pre production, getting everything prepared, shooting and editing. So really, just the whole nine yards. I'll go ahead and let Corey introduce himself there. Yeah, my name is Corey Christian. I am a multimedia marketer here at Next to Me Marketing. So I uh, assist Aaron in all things video, um, just kind of lend a hand wherever I can as far as kind of creative assets goes. Absolutely. So we're going to hop into just a few things before we get into the bulk of the presentation. The first thing we want to talk about is the HubSpot Video Marketing Study Group. So for everyone in attendance, you're probably part of this group already, but if you are not, make sure you go and sign up for this group because it's a place where you can ask anything video related. And we're going to go ahead and answer you there. So think of this as if you can come to our office hours or our hug events, if you need a question and one of those events are not happening, hop into the study group and ask away. There's a whole community of people that will respond to you. And then Corey and I are actively engaging in there as well and answering people's questions. So again, if you have anything video related questions, uh, whether it's pre-production, post-production, whether it's uh, video ideas and concepts, what you name it, go ahead and ask the question in there and you're sure to get an answer back. And then second thing I want to talk about is registering for that next hug event. So we did just talk about this on that title screen, but our next hug event will be on October 27th. And we're going to talk about everything post-production related. So video editing, what kind of editing platforms you can use, the hosting platforms you can use, and then how we measure the success of all those videos via the analytics. And then last, the third thing I do want to talk about is going to be our bootcamp for video marketing, sales, and service. Now, bootcamp is a little bit more uh, extensive in the sense of office hours and these hugs because it's a six-week course designed for you to sign up and learn all video-related concepts, recording yourself and just getting comfortable on camera. So we kind of split it in two different versions. One is we make you record on a weekly basis a video as a homework assignment and we'll give you grades and we'll optimize your lighting and your framing, the whole nine yards there. On the same exact time, we walk you through the entire process of creating a full production video, right? So all the steps we take in pre-production and then everything that needs to be thought about while recording and what goes on during while you're on set and then following into the editing portion where we walk you through post-production and talk about color grading versus color correcting and the whole nine yards in that regard. And then we wrap it all up with a nice post analysis on how we measure success with those videos by going into Wistia analytics and talking about different analytics that we track to determine whether a video is successful or what we need to do to improve that video. So it is uh, very extensive in that sense, um, but you will learn a lot and it's a very valuable course. So if this sounds like something you're interested in and you really want to get the ball rolling on video production in your agency, or you just want to get more comfortable on camera, this course is definitely for you. And there's a lot of great community support as well, right? Like because we utilize a Slack channel to kind of communicate back and forth between all of the students, um, everyone can kind of give each other feedback and keep in touch and things like that. So it develops kind of a, a, a more long-term kind of relationship in that way, which is great. Yeah, absolutely. And we created this entire community on Slack. So now we're about to run, uh, we're currently in our third iteration of the bootcamp. We're going to be in our fourth in Q4. 
And we are continuously creating this community via Slack. And so you'll be part of the Q1, Q2, and Q3 groups. So as you post those videos, other people are chiming in from previous uh, boot camps and they're they're giving feedback now as well. So it, it's another just place to create that community engagement and get valuable feedback from people who have already gone through the boot camp. So that's a good point, Corey. All right, so we'll hop into the agenda today, everything we're gonna be discussing. First, we're going to go pretty deep into video cameras, right? We're going to talk about entry-level cameras. Then we'll get into that mid-level of the marketing cameras and kind of that sweet spot that, that we're looking at. And then we'll talk a little bit about the high-end cameras and the differences of what they can achieve versus other cameras. Then we'll get into audio gear. So microphones and recording devices specifically. And we'll talk about the different microphones you can utilize and what scenarios you should use those mics, so on and so forth. Then we'll talk about lighting equipment. Mainly, we'll talk a little bit about LED panels, but just more so tips on how to improve your lighting in your frame. And then that'll just naturally flow into framing your video and how to get your frame optimally set up. And then last, we'll go over just some tips and what to do while recording so you're not uh, you know, too nervous on camera, things like that. So we'll hop into it. First thing we'll discuss is video cameras, right? So we'll get into the beginner stuff you're looking at a webcam, right? So obviously entry-level cameras, this is, we're thinking of your recording videos from your computer. It's the easiest and quickest way to record videos. And this is how we got started with video at Nextony. You know, when Gabriel, our CEO, decided that he wanted to get video imp implemented into Nextony, we started doing it at a very basic level by just recording these simple videos through a webcam, right? So you might say, yeah, this is great. I really want to record, let's say, a video voicemail or just an email signature for myself. Okay, I can use my webcam, but my webcam kind of looks a little grainy and, and doesn't look that good. So that's where we're looking at these Logitech webcams. They're external webcams where you can attach to your computer and they'll record up to 4K resolution. So of course, you can pick ones up that are a little less expensive and they'll do lower resolution, but they will go up to 4K. So that's right off the bat, you're already improving from your internal webcam. So it's really good. You can continue to record you know, basic videos like I mentioned, email signature, video voicemails, um, sales FAQ videos, things of that nature, where you're in front of the camera, you're not showing a whole lot of B-roll and you're just creating these really simple and effective strategic videos. Corey, you have uh, anything to add there on top of these webcam stuff? Yeah, I was going to say, I think you can also include uh, cell phones at this point as well, too, right? Like, everyone has a, an iPhone or an Android phone that has a pretty decent camera on it these days. Like, most of them are at least 1080. At this point, you've got a lot of them that can do 4K and, like, HDR. And the new iPhones have, like, cinematic defocus and all this really interesting features that they can do now. And that's a camera that you have in your pocket all day long. Not only can you use it for, you know, selfie mode, kind of recording yourself or getting kind of an easy setup, but you can also start to kind of branch out and get a little bit more complex and, you know, start filming some B-roll and getting some additional shots and things like that, which is cool. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point. Just utilizing your phone. And that's something we always say because we get the question almost every day. We're going to see it in the study group or we get a message on Slack or we just get an email asking us what gear should I pick up and purchase to get started recording video? And we always tell the same exact story, right? The best camera is the one you already have. It's in your pocket and it records amazing footage. So start utilizing your phone if you really want to start diving headfirst into video, right? And of course, a webcam is a perfect start. But like Corey mentioned, you can go out and you can record B-roll, which is just relevant footage to what you're speaking to, and then overlay that atop your webcam footage to just create a better produced video. So definitely webcams, cell phones, this is going to be your entry level, no cost or low expense to get started into video. All right, now I'm going to hop over to the next slide here. We're going to talk a little bit about marketing cameras. So Corey, do you want to talk just about the differences in, in mirrorless and DSLRs and how they're just an improvement to those webcams and cell phones? Sure. Yeah. I mean, if, you know, kind of thinking about you know, yes, webcams are great. Cell phones are great, right? But at the end of the day, when you want to start increasing the quality or the user friendliness of the objects that you're using to film, um, that's where kind of a more dedicated device comes in, like one of these cameras here. 
Um, these things are such a step up in quality these days that they're already about nine, what 90% of consumers need. I mean, you're going to get a ton of really great features, even at these kind of entry level prices. Um, and I mean, you know, when you start talking about, you know, like the A7 III is about $2,000 or so, it's like, yes, that is an investment. I understand that. Um, but comparatively to like, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, when even a camcorder would be like six or $7,000, these things have really come down in price um, and they've democratized the market a lot, which is great. Um, so you've got cameras like, for example, I mentioned that Sony A7 III, um, the Panasonic Lumix, that GH6 or the Canon R6. These are all really, really great options. And again, I think $2,000 to $2,500 or so for these, um, you do have to buy like, you know, lenses and some extra batteries and like, you'll want to purchase additional um, accessories for them, right? Um, but you're going to be able to get, you know, 4K at 60p and 10 bit color and just really high quality files that are very detailed and a significant step up, you know, almost movie level quality at that point out of some of these guys, uh, certainly TV level quality um, compared to, you know, kind of the, the cell phone image, which although it is great. These things definitely are going to get you more latitude. It's going to look a little better in maybe adverse conditions where you don't have good lighting and stuff like that. So these really do kind of step you up. Um, I mean, almost all the way to kind of the peak of what you really need. Like I said, not about 90% of people are fine with something like this. Um, you know, it does help to get multiple cameras and to try and get multiple angles and things like that. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, starting out with something like this and kind of expanding your gear kit from there is a really great starting point to be able to produce, you know, the highest quality web content. Yeah, absolutely. And that that's a good point. We started with cell phone footage ourselves sat next to me when we got started with video, like I was mentioning in the last slide. We were doing webcam videos to just get into directly communicating with our clients through video. But then when we took it to the next level, Gabriel decided he wanted to start producing videos for our clients going out to places. So one of our clients, it was a, uh, think of like an Airbnb style company where they rent out these, these nice homes and they wanted walkthrough videos. So we started with cell phones, but we started to realize that the lighting in some of these homes were really poor. Even with all the lights on, the phone was just not picking up the footage optimally. So we eventually went over to a Sony and we got, so you can see the sensors in the bodies there on mm -hmm. the actual screen. That sensor will act, allow a lot more light into the camera. And so it'll be able to process an image a lot better and just produce a better image overall in quality. And you'll see the shadows are not nearly as dark. You'll be able to brighten them up and you'll just have more flexibility in the editing process overall. So these just give a lot more flexibility in terms of what you can capture and the quality that you can capture versus those cell phones that we talked about in that last uh, slide. Yeah, it's not so much about like, I want to take this thing and, you know, edit it to make it look like the Avengers or something, you know, it's not, it's not so much that it's like, right, right like Aaron mentioned, like this, this studio or this home is like, it's kind of dark and I've only have so much light. It's like, these are going to naturally give you a boost in quality over something like a cell phone would. Yeah, sure, you can take it to the extreme, you can make it look really beautiful, but by their very design, they're going to improve your image quality just as themselves, which is awesome. Absolutely. All right, and we'll hop over to the next cameras here. Corey, you want to talk a bit about these production cameras and how they differ? Sure. Yeah, so this this kind of steps up again in quality from here, right? And and this gets into the range of now you are beginning to produce a significant amount of content for not only yourself, but clients as well, right? And probably multiple clients at this point. Um, the big thing that cameras like this start to provide is longer extended run times. So all three of these cameras actually have fans built into them. You can kind of see it on, for example, on the side of that Canon, there's some lines on the right hand side. Um, all three of these cameras are actively cooled as opposed to like a passive cooling system um, where there's no actual fan in any of these models, right? So these can tend to, if you have to do long, you know, half hour, hour long, two hour long content, you know, like think things like um, conventions or long form pieces, 
Um, these are the cameras that you're going to want to start using for that. They are much better. They can actually record, you know, in theory, endlessly until your media fills up. Um, they offer things like better power solutions. So you can kind of just plug these into a wall power. They also have bigger battery packs. Um, you get things like, if you look on the top of both of those two cameras on the bottom, they both have these kind of big microphone attachments even as well. So those are for, you know, more higher end professional shotgun microphones. So they know that you are going to be utilizing, you know, professional level equipment with this. So they've kind of upgraded everything about the camera. There's headphone ports, there's XLRs for audio. There's just a lot more kind of tactile features. You start to get things like, um, built-in ND filters, neutral density filters that are kind of like putting um, sunglasses on your camera, right? So it helps when you go outside to darken the image, but maintain that nice kind of blurry background. That's ND filters are great for that. These have them already built in, you know, the two bottom ones there. So you can easily just kind of apply that, darken the image and be able to open your lens up and get that nice soft background. It looks really pretty, right? So these make that a lot easier just by naturally having a lot of those things built in. They're a lot more convenient. They're also a jump up in price. They're about two to three times the price of the cameras on the previous slide, somewhere between that four and $6,000 range. Um, so significant jump up in quality uh again you know i mean things like there is internal raw recording in that can and there's kind of even more features that some of these can do versus the the kind of ones on the previous models um but i would say the biggest thing is that it increases your run times right it makes it more convenient to film on so yes these are more expensive but they make overall they make your work a little bit easier which is nice um it becomes a quality of life Thing that is really beneficial when you are taking on a lot more clients or a lot more kind of just production work in general. These can be really convenient for that. And you can always think of, for example, pairing maybe one of these with one of the previous cameras, right? So you can kind of get complementary systems like that. Absolutely. That's that's the range we are at in Nexony uh, as well. So we're going into that production level where we're going to pick up that Sony, that top camera for to be our new main camera while we still utilize one of these cameras from the previous slides as our B camera. So we can intercut uh, in between each of them. And that way our color profiles and everything stays the same because we're still with one brand. So just another thing to point out. And these cameras, you know, like Corey just mentioned, they're two to three times that price of the previous model, right? So you're looking at maybe $6,000, $7,000 for one of these guys, but they don't touch the next cameras in, in terms of price and comparison. So Corey, do you want that to talk is true. Yeah, do you want to talk a little bit about these cinema cameras and just like why they're so expensive and what do yes. they do? Yeah, I mean, so the, the, the most important thing, I guess, to know about these is that they do exist, right? Like they are outside of the usage realm of the majority of people. I mean, these are rental cameras. These are used for high budget commercials, feature films, um, uh, television shows, things like that. Like, for example, red cameras have been used on like all of Marvel content. Um, the airy cameras have been filmed. I mean, go look at any any year of award season and almost all of them are filmed on airy cameras. It's it's crazy how much content is produced on them. And then you have things like the Sony Venice, which is being used on the new Avatar movies and just a lot of really high budget um, things. What kind of brings these up even higher? A lot of these are 8K cameras, right? So they are, are even higher. You can see the, the Venice right there even has 8K on the front of it. So they're even, you know, if you're used to saying 4K TVs and things like that, this is now again, even larger than that. It's even doubled again, right? Um, so these are significantly higher quality um, recording. They all tend to shoot things like raw or have some kind of raw recording option. Um, the cons here really is, I mean, it's cost, right? Other than that, it's like everything is going to be more expensive. You know, your media, your lenses, your tripods, like everything kind of jumps up into the next stratosphere of um, currency at that point. But that, that, I mean, that's it. Like and these have everything right. you want. The reason that these things are so much is because if you look at it, there's power outputs on them. There's various monitoring and, and video outputs. There's wireless communication in them. There's all sorts of these 
just features that are just built into it. So if you've ever seen those kind of like monstrosity builds where you just get these cameras that are like, well, I put this on it and this monitor and this and this, and you just start building out this gigantic, huge thing. These already have everything built into it. They've got wireless transmitters. Mm -hmm. They've got all of that stuff all built into the camera so that all you have to do, put it on a tripod, put a lens on it, and you can start kind of getting to work pretty quickly. Um, they're not really going to be used by the majority of people. Like I said, most people don't even really own things like these. They tend to be in rental houses. They tend to be rented out for specific jobs. I mean, the only time I could see, you know, most people really using this, like I said, is for, you know, a big budget commercial, right? You want to shoot something actually for, you know, for television, like a network spot or something like that. That's where something like this could come into handy. Um, but I mean, like I said, unless you're really doing some really high level work, there's not a whole lot of need for this kind of stuff in the general kind of marketing realm. Um, so it's, we wanted to touch on them and let you guys know that, that they exist, that they are, you know, they are out there, but these things are, you know, $30,000 and up, you know, you can spend a, a hundred thousand dollars on one of these and still need to be purchasing additional lenses and batteries and like all of this other kind of equipment and accoutrements for it. So this gets to the point where money's not an object anymore. You want the ultimate in quality. This is it. This is what you go with. Yeah, absolutely. That really well put there. And I just posted a link in the chat actually to, um, it's an entire series created by Wistia, the, the hosting platform we use at Nextony. And what they did was they created basically the same commercial, but with a budget of $100. I think the second budget was either 1000 or 10000 And then the third budget was 100000 And so what they did was they spent you know 100 k on the same exact commercial that they created for $100. But what they did was they went out and picked up one of these cameras and rented it. And so you can... If you go and click that link and just watch the videos, you'll see the quality jump and change. But it's really interesting because it's really fun to see how creative and unique and what they did with the really, really small budget versus the entire massive crew and the big giant cameras and lights that they have with that $100,000 budget for the shoot. So definitely unique and go check that out if you're interested in learning a little bit more about cameras and how they just work in general. So we'll hop over to the next section here. Audio equipment. So we're going to talk about types of microphones first before we get into the levels of microphones. And what you need mm -hmm. to know is there's really three types of microphones that you're looking at, right? You're looking at a dynamic condenser microphone, which you see there, a picture on the left. Then you have a lavalier or a lapel microphone, the ones in the middle there. And then on the right, we have shotgun or boom microphones they're typically referred as. And they're all used in different scenarios. Basically, we're looking at dynamic condenser microphones. We're using it right now. I, I have it just out of frame. I can actually, if I do this maybe, nope, there we go. You can see the microphone as it just kind of pops into frame there. So this is a dynamic condenser microphone and it's mainly used in these studio conditions, right? I have controlled sound. I'm in a room with the door shut. There's no cars outside making loud noises. The air conditioner is not going or anything. And so I'm able to use this microphone very effectively. It's not so good. You're not going to take this out on set and record out in the streets with this. Again, it's more of this studio environment to record voiceovers and things of that nature. They're very then sensitive have... to noise. So they, they tend not to perform well outside of controlled conditions. You can even hear it just as yeah. Aaron touched his mic before. You could hear kind of the handling noise, like that little kind of rumble mm -hmm. sound. That's inherent with these kind of microphones just because of the design of them. Absolutely. Yeah, you're definitely not supposed to touch them, even though I'm very, <laughs> uh, you know, I always want to. So, um, so the second type of microphone is going to be a lavalier or a lapel microphone. And there's two different versions from that picture there. The top one, it's a wired connection. And so you've seen these before on news and different things where people have a little clipped microphone on their shirt. And so they're speaking directly into that. And so all their voice from their throat is going straight there and it's producing a really high quality sound. And this is for when you're on set and you have multiple people speaking, you can lapel all of them up and just get that really deep voice from them. There's also wireless options. You can see the Rode microphones pictured there. Those you can clip on. And Corey was talking about those really high level cameras. These are built into those cameras, but of course, if you're not using them, you're gonna utilize a wireless system where you have a transmitter and a receiver 
And the transmitter is, of course, sending it over to the receiver that's feeding usually into the camera. And then you have shotgun slash boom microphone. This is going to be when you have a whole group of people, right? And let's say you can't, you only have two lapel microphones. You have four people that are talking and seen. If you've ever seen a behind the scenes of a video shoot and you always see the guy with his arms up, he's holding a real long pole right over top of everybody that's speaking on camera. That is what's called the boom pole or the shotgun pole. And so they are microphoning all of the people on set right above the frame. So that's kind of the three differences of all those microphones. Corey, you have anything to add there? Yeah, I mean, it, the key in audio, right, to get the best possible quality is to get the microphone as close as you can to your source. So uh, usually the one of these that tends to sound the cleanest is the lavalier. So if you can opt to being able to, you know, get a microphone up here and they even manage to hide these and like, for example, they use them in like Broadway and stuff like that. They'll hide it in people's wigs and stuff like that. Like you can get away with really hiding these things really creatively and manage to get really great quality audio. Um, in marketing content, we don't necessarily have to hide them so much. It's not the end of the world if someone sees, you know, a mic right. on someone's shirt as they're talking. So these can be a really great option. And the wired ones are very affordable. I mean, less than $100, you can get a couple wired ones for um, and be able to kind of just plug everybody in and record their audio, get a really nice, clean individual source from everyone. Um, but much to Aaron's point, there are those scenarios where you just need kind of wide coverage and you kind of want a little bit more of that natural sound of the room or the environment. That's where those shotgun mics work. That's where those boom mics are. Um, and you can pair them with, you know, uh, they make things like Zeppelins and big kind of wind protection elements on it so that when you go outside, you can really isolate your dialogue still um, without hearing all kind of wind and noise. But you'll still get that kind of natural you know, the feeling of the environment, you'll hear the birds, you'll hear the the water and stuff like that. Like you get a lot more kind of natural sound out of a, a, a shotgun or boom microphone. Yeah, absolutely. All right. And we're going to hop over into the different points of entry for uh, audio gear. So what you're going to be looking for an entry level, mid-level and, and high level uh, different gear here. So the first one we'll talk about is going to be entry level, right? And we have Pictured here is going to be, we talked about using your cell phone as an entry level video gear. Audio gear, you can see it has that little lightning connection, or you can get a USB connection for Android. And these pop right on your phone and they pick up nice audio, right? It's not going to be crystal clear, perfect audio, but it will enhance the sound, especially the sound from your phone. So we recommend those. They're relatively inexpensive. I want to say you can pick one up for anywhere between $20 to $30. Um, you know, and they range in price. Of course, you can find them a little bit higher end. That'll just be better dynamically to pick that audio up. Um, but they're really great. And again, very affordable. And then like Corey was just mentioning with the lavalier microphones, you can pick up several lobs for a hundred bucks, even less than that. And they plug straight into the camera or your cell phone. And so you can just use them to, again, enhance your audio for a very cheap price. All right, hopping over to mid-level here, we're going to talk just, this is more of a dedicated lavalier microphone, right? So you see there the picture on the left, that's a Tascam. And what it is, it's basically just the recording device is built in. So you don't need a phone to plug it into, or you don't have to go straight into the camera, right? Let's say you want to microphone someone up that's really far away from the camera, and you don't have that, like that wire to the lavalier. It doesn't run that far, right? something like this would be very effective because they can just put it in their back pocket. They can hide the wire mm -hmm. and they can be mic mic'd up and ready to go. And then on and the even, right hand side there, normal, you see. I was just going to say, even sorry, like sorry, normal I'm, wireless I'm transmitters sometimes can be, um, you know, finicky to have to deal with like connecting them and all that stuff. The nice thing about this is that it's just, it has the recorder built in. They just put it in their pocket and they're good to go, which is great. Absolutely. And then the shotgun microphone you see on the right hand side, it's an attachment to the camera. This is going to be, uh, what is it, the road video, road video mic, Corey, something like that? That's the road video micro. That's what that one is. So it's really, really micro, compact. Micro, it comes that. on a little spring mount. Yeah. And it, it comes with, um, it comes with that little fuzzy, the dead cat that they call it. Um, and it just connects with, you know, just a little 3.5 millimeter, just a little headphone jack thing. Uh, right into the back of the mic and into your camera. 
Um, this particular one does isn't compatible with all cameras because it doesn't have a battery in it. So you need to make sure that your camera is compatible with it. Um, but they are they're awesome little little guys. And like I said, they come with that wind protection. So you pop that thing on outside and instantly you get a much better quality, much more natural sounding audio than what the camera would offer. Absolutely. And then you want to go ahead and just cover these this high end gear here. Sure. Yeah, so this is this this is kind of the the level of equipment again that that gets to full blown production, right? So what you have on the left there, that's a Sennheiser G4. These are the gold standard in lavalier microphones. You see the one on the left has the microphone plug on it. That is what you would uh, attach to your body. You would wear that body pack with you know your lav actually mounted on yourself. And then the one on the right would be the receiver. So that's receiving the signal from the other one and can record it or put it into a mixer or put it into the camera itself. Um, so there's, there's kind of various ways to do it. These guys are used on, I mean, almost every television show, you know, right? Like these are some of the most absolute common. They are some of the most standard pieces of equipment. If you notice all three of the items on this page are actually all Sennheiser. Um, when you get to a certain level of equipment, there's not a lot of, um, competition for the really high end products. So Sennheiser is an old German brand. They are one of the uh, gold standards in the industry, as I mentioned. Um, the option in the middle there is the MKE 600 shotgun microphone. This thing is, I mean, again, if you want to boom a microphone, this is the one to use outdoors. It uh, really isolates your sounds. It's a super cardioid pickup pattern. So it's really kind of pointed forward really well. Um, and it tends to resist a lot of noise from the outside. Um, Indoors, they're not the best. They can be a little bit echoey. That's where something like the mic on the right hand would come in. That's the NKH50. Um, again, anything indoors, this is the mic to go with. This is the absolute most beautiful sounding microphones. I mean, they come with a price. These are thousands of dollars, um, but they are by far and away the you know top quality sounding things. Like these are in the kit of every working professional uh, audio engineer that are that are out there field field recording engineers. Awesome. And we'll talk a little bit about audio recording devices. Corey, you want to take this one as well? Yeah. So kind of this, this, this is kind of just additional equipment here, right? So on the left, you have kind of two options for recording. Um, the Tascam DR40, they're like 200 bucks or so. These are going to be some of the like I'd say best kind of entry level, um, you know, XLR capable recording devices. If you're just trying to record some audio, this is one of the kind of easiest ways to start doing that. Um, if you want to step up from there, something like the Mix Pre 3, anything by sound devices or video devices, they make really amazing quality products. These are kind of the next step up from that. So these have kind of more mixing controls you can see like the actual dials on them so you can kind of adjust on the fly and you can make those um more kind of granular control adjustments which is awesome um they are a step up in, in price and you know you can get three six like there's there's multiple inputs if you need them as well um so there's there's kind of a, a you know a solution for kind of any level problem at that point um they, like I said, they do kind of increase in price at that point. But if you need to record, you know, five different people all speaking at once, you need a six input recorder. So that would be kind of the option to go with. Um, on the right hand side, we have some headphones. There are kind of the, the ones in the front. Those are the uh, MDR 7506s by Sony. Those are, I mean, if you've been in any sound mixing studio probably a lot of schools have these like these are the headphones of headphones they are everywhere they've been the standard for 20 30 years at this point like every you've probably seen these headphones somewhere in your life um the ones above them the sonals those are kind of just a i think they're about half the price admittedly um and they're very similar in, in quality but basically some kind of over ear headphone like this is really great for monitoring audio. Um, little earbuds and, you know, sound canceling headphones and stuff like that are convenient. Um, but when you're recording audio, you want to make sure you're hearing everything that's being recorded. So you want to make sure you're getting kind of a really 
known sum of a headphone, something like the 7506s or the Sonals. Those are really great options. Um, and they're pretty comfy too. They got big cushions on them so you can wear them all day long. Um, just really great options. And I think the Sonys are like less than a hundred bucks. The other ones are like less than 50 bucks. Like they're not, they're not a, a yeah. super expensive investment, um, but they'll make sure that you can really hear your audio that you're recording. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, we just threw a ton of audio equipment information at you and we're going to move straight forward into lighting. So if you guys do have any questions about anything audio related, make sure to put that in the chat and we'll answer that at the end during our Q&A session. We're going to hop over into lighting now. So just discussing what we utilize in lighting. And there are so many lighting options. And initially we started putting this presentation together and I started putting in Fresnel lights and just it, it's overkill, right? Like we, I, I want to touch on the cameras and the audio gear because it's, it's important to know, but there are so many different lights out there that I really just want to focus on what we would be utilizing and, and how we're going to go about lighting a, a setup, right? So LED lighting is by far the most utilized for lower budget productions, right? And when I say lower budget, I don't mean cheap production. I don't mean we're sacrificing quality. LED panels can do everything you want, right? They're, they're either battery or plug-in power. So they're very versatile in that sense. And you can stick some batteries on them and get them placed anywhere you really want, right? But we use a mixture of the natural lighting with the LED panels, right? So if you don't have LED panels and you really want to focus on just improving the overall lighting of your frame, and you can see there from the images on the screen there, I did a before and after. I basically just set up a few LED panels on left and right and gave myself just a small backlight versus a completely unlit scenario. And you can see how well it just improves the overall lighting and just gives that subject more oomph in the image there. So I want to talk just about lighting tricks without LEDs, right? Because LED panels, they are cheap and they're, in, they're not too inexpensive, but you have to go out and you have to pick them right. And so if you want to shoot video right now, what can we do to improve our lighting to get uh, our, our framing as optimal as we can, right? And so this slide, using a window if applicable, right? Right now, I currently have one artificial light on me. I have this ring light here to my left-hand side. And you can see it in my glasses in the reflection. You can kind of see it. And if I turn this off, you'll be able to actually see how that just puts a lot more shadow on me. But I still have a lot of light coming in. You can see there. And that's naturally from a window. So I'm doing a combination of artificial light with natural light to just kind of give that production level a step up if with the lighting. Let's say you don't have an LED panel and you don't have a window, right? What can we do to improve our lighting scenario? And that's where you're going to look for any sort of desk lamp, any sort of light source that you can just find. Anything that's just emitting a light source, try to place it in front of you at a certain angle to just give a little bit of light spilling onto the front of you. Now, let's say that light is really, really harsh, right? Okay, you find a flashlight and that's your only light source and that's just a strict beam of light. How can we diffuse that? And so you can soften a, a really strong central light with a diffuser. And there's so many DIYs you can utilize. You know, I've seen people use shower curtains, bed sheets, things like that, or they reflect that light using a reflective material, right? So you can take a big cardboard panel, cover it with aluminum foil, and then take that really centralized beam of light it hits it and then it reflects off and it spreads that light. It softens it out, right? So the main focus here is finding a light source, but making sure that it's not too centralized and it's not causing way too much contrast on you versus your background. And then last thing I want to touch on is color diffusers, right? You can use gels to get a certain hue of color where, you know, if it, let's say your frame's really, really warm and your light is really cool. It's emitting more of that bluish tone. You can put a warm gel on it to really emphasize the warmthness and just change the color temperature of that light to correct your frame there. And we had a uh, question in the boot camp the other day of what color lighting, like warm or cool light should I use? And our answer to it was like, well, it really depends, right? Because 
if you are in a room that's receiving a lot of you know natural light or something for example like aaron's he probably is going to want to keep that light source nice and cool to kind of try and match that natural lighting whereas like i for example am using some kind of tungsten warmer light bulbs in this room so i'm going to want a little bit more of a warmer color temperature to come out of my light you think about just trying to match the color temperature of lights that you're using and if you're in an environment that has kind of a mixed lighting scenario put it in like kind of a middle setting and use kind of 50 50. so just think about the color lighting that you would use is usually dependent on kind of what other light sources are available in the frame already and so you try to just kind of match that so that your white balance all looks the same mm -hmm. And then in terms of where you set your lights up, right? We want to just speak to the location of the lights. And I put together this really easy chart because the three-point lighting technique is basically the most common lighting technique you're going to see across production sets and just what they educate you in university and things like that. So it's really simple. It's a key light, a fill light, and a backlight. And you can see from the image there, you put a key light on one side, and that's more of like I was saying, a more centralized focused light. And then the fill light is on the opposite side. So what that does is it causes kind of that really uh, soft contrast from one side of your face to the other, where it doesn't have the same exact light emitting on your face. So it doesn't cause that flat image, but it brings out more of the, just like the, what am I trying contouring. to say? Like the depth of your, yeah, yeah exactly. The contouring of the, of your subject. So that does a really good job where it's uh, offsetting each other really well. And then you have the backlight, which is really just giving you that halo effect around the body or around the subject to pull your subject out from the background. So it's really important to, when you're shooting on production, to just try to set these lights up in that general sense. And of course, every unique situation requires a little bit of MacGyvering and placing lights in certain spots. But for a general sense, this is a really good uh, just uh, template to utilize when setting up your lights. And then, of course, we, we already talked about hard versus soft light, the, the spotlight versus spreading your light out. And then light temperature, you can change that with color range lights like Corey was talking about, where you can make a color of your light a little bit cooler or warmer. Or if you don't have that feature on a light, you can throw a gel over it to correct the color temperature. And another thing, just to kind of note on the three-point lighting techno technique, it doesn't have to be three physical lights, right? Like, for example, much in Aaron's mm -hmm. case or in my case, I have a window from, from this side, I have a light coming from behind me, and then I have a light here. So I'm using a three-point lighting setup, even though I'm only, I only have two physical lights, my window is acting as one of those sources. So again, placement in the room and framing and kind of deciding that where you're going to film this, take into account natural lighting sources as an option as well. Awesome. And we'll get over to our last subject. We're going to talk about framing. It's pretty simple here. This is just kind of the, we, we, we always talk about the four pillars of video production. And so framing kind of falls into that fourth pillar, right? We talk about video, audio, lighting, and then framing. And framing, the most important thing is just making sure your subject is well framed in the background first and foremost. You don't want to cut their heads off too much or you don't want to leave a lot of headspace, right? You want to get that just nice image where the head's close to the top of the frame, but not, not cutting off at all. And then in terms of background, what you want to add in, you want to make sure it's clean and there's nothing distracting. I tell everyone the most important thing is don't have a big sign with a bunch of wording on it because people are going to start being distracted. It's, even if you're energetic, outgoing, and you're really emphasizing the content, there's always people that go, you know, they get tired, they start reading something, they get distracted, and they're not digesting the actual content that you're speaking to. So always make sure that your frame is just nice and clean. And again, there's nothing distracting at all. If you want to add things into the background, just try to make it a little relevant to what you're speaking to, right? So if we're doing an educational course all about video, ideally, I might really emphasize my frame to have a video camera in the background or might to emphasize a light, just to add relevance to that framing. And then angles and distance, the only thing that we really want to emphasize here of importance, make sure your eye level to the camera. It's really important because if you have that weird angle looking down on someone, it's almost hindering their ability 
to speak to what they're they're an expert at, right? Like when you look down at someone with a camera angle, it almost it's looking down on them almost in real life. And then the same exact situation where you're looking up at someone, it's making them powerful or kind of scary looking. And so it just gives this really unappealing look. Uh, and subconsciously it adds this effect to where you think that person doesn't know what they're talking about, or that person is arrogant or something. So eye level is actually very crucially important to just make sure you have the subject frame right. And so they're looking natural as well. And then we say six to 10 feet distance, that's going to be, you know, in scenarios, you, you might be further than that, you might be closer than that. But that's a good rule of thumb when setting up the tripod and placing a subject in front of you. Six to 10 feet is kind of a good starting point to understand where you should be. And the more you can kind of get and them to we'll step away from the background as well tends to be pretty helpful because you can kind of blur that background mm -hmm. out. A lot of times if you're in an office or something like that, things are very compressed. It's a small space. It is what it is. But if you can manage to kind of, for example, if someone's sitting in front of like a bookshelf or something like that, if they're right up against the bookshelf, you're going to be reading the titles the whole time, right? Whereas if you can set yeah. the person back a little bit further, maybe you can't see them as much. Maybe they're in the kind of bokeh. They're a little bit more out of focus. You can also like flip the books around, for example, and just kind of show the, the pages, not the spine. So there's those kind of little tricks that you can you can use to, to make things less distracting as well. Um, just the other day, someone mentioned that there is an outlet plug in someone's video move a potted plant in front of it, right? Like think about those uh, small things that you can do to remove those distracting elements and make things simpler on your viewer. Absolutely. And then just wanna touch on this very quickly. This was a frame that we did intentionally when we were recording a video, uh, a whole series about tips and tricks with video, right? So it's called Next Studio. And we just walk you through how to build your at-home video studio setup while we're doing work from home. So this was a really good series. And you can see, I just added a camera in the background to give a little bit of relevance on my computer. I have an editing platform going. So as I'm speaking to all these videos, tips and tricks, you see the relevancy in the background. So that's what we're just trying to achieve, making sure we're well lit in place and we have relevant things going on in the background. All right, and then we'll hop over to the remote video studio. So this is, to just bring all of that information into one singular slide, right? You might say, okay, tons of cameras, tons of lights, tons of audio equipment, like where do I start? And, you know, we, we walked you through all the entry level things, but if you want an at home, all in one video studio ready to go, then look at something like this. Corey just shared the blog post in the chat, and this will basically walk you through how to get the equipment you need to get started recording video, how to get it all set up. That way you can simply USB plug straight into your computer and use this really nice mirrorless camera as a webcam to get higher quality recordings. And then when you're ready to take video production to the next level, you can take that camera off of this, this unit, go out into the field, capture your B-roll shots, and start to learn a little bit more advanced video editing. Start overlaying those B-roll clips over top of what you're talking about to just bring your video production to the next level. So this is a really great uh, product to just get into entry of video, but also to expand your video services as well. So if that sounds interesting, definitely check out the blog post that we just shared there. And then we'll hop into our last slide that we're gonna talk about, just tips and tricks about when you're recording video, right? So a lot of people, what they do is they'll do all this work for video and they'll get the camera and they'll get the gear and they'll get everything set up and they'll sit down in front of the camera, they'll hit record and they're like deer in headlights. It is very daunting to record your first video. And so we just always say practice, 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 repetition, right? Always first off, remember all the pre-production work that you've done. So. In our boot camp, this is a really good example. We walk you through how to create an outline, how to create a brief, how to get your script created. And so we do all of this pre-production work before we hit record. So when you're hitting record, remember, think about all that work you did and all of the topics you created and understand and know you are the master at your subject, right? So just remember that and speak to what you're thinking about. Then don't be afraid to mess up, right? That's what editing is for. You can always stop and restart lines. So if you get nervous and you fumble your words, it's okay. Just stop, go back to the beginning of the sentence and continue to go because you will find out that's very easy to just clip out in the editing portion. 
then focus on the content, not the lens. This is, this is really easy to say and hard to do, um, but it, it's worth reiterating because again, if you are recording video, be confident in yourself, you know, give off that positive complexion where you know what you're talking about, right? You, you're the expert of your subject. So just understand and remember that you're just speaking content, forget about the lens, forget about that little camera and just be the master of what you are speaking to. And then body language, just like I was saying, right? Give that positive infectious energy, you know, bring that energy in up. No one wants to listen to a really monotone, boring voice that's just reciting the same things over and over again. It just get you get lost, you get flooded, and you just want to click off the video. Bring the body language and remember to just always look engaged. And then last thing is, if you nailed your take in the very first try, never assume that. Always re-record your good take and double down on it because there have been so many times personally where I've I've done a one and done recording. I go back and guess what? I didn't hear the motorcycle that just drove past my house. And so in my recording, I have a big sound that I totally missed while recording. So there's so many things that can happen while recording. And if you are the subject and you're talking, you're gonna miss certain things that are gonna be happening during that recording. So always review your footage and always double down to a good recording because on top of that, you might nail it even better on the second try. So even if your first take was perfect, your second take might be better. And then you can just utilize that second take as well. So those are just some tips and tricks when recording. Uh, Corey, you have anything to add there? Yeah, I guess just kind of to touch on the body language thing. One of the things I always say is just try to remember to smile while you're talking, right? Because naturally smiling automatically brings your energy level up, right? You're not going to sound so monotone and bored. If you have a big smile on your face, right? Try to be in a good attitude. Try to be in that good headspace. Even if things get frustrating and, you know, you can't remember lines and you fumble, take a second, take a break, and just kind of remember to, to keep that composure and just keep that energy up. And try it enough times and you'll get through it. I mean, the best actors in the world need multiple takes, right? Like if Tom Hanks is going to take six takes to do something, like what's it going to take me, 600, you know? Like, so just know that it's it, it, it takes work. It's not just a skill that that comes naturally to everyone. Um, so it is something to kind of to 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 polish and to work on and to um, just be considerate of. And again, just putting a smile on your face, make, face makes all the difference in this for sure. Yeah, and, and just to re reiterate the same thing I said at the very beginning of the slide, repetition, repetition, repetition. Practice videos on a daily basis, You know, whether it's a, an email response, right? If you're gonna write a whole walkthrough on, hey, this is how you utilize this software, or, hey, yeah, I, I can walk you through this. Don't put it together in a step-by-step -step text. Get on something as simple as Wistia Recorder or Vidyard or Loom Recorder, right? These are just built-in recorders straight into your browser where you can utilize your webcam and record a video. You'll see the response is going to be so much more effective because people just naturally gravitate towards video. They're going to initially want to watch a video versus reading an entire blog post. So just getting started, always remember that keep that repetition going, get comfortable on camera, and it'll naturally just evolve into just a well-oiled machine. And like I said, just continue that process and you will get better. Yep, make video part of your everyday life. Just make it part of everything you do and try and incorporate it anywhere you can and you'll notice that the quality will increase. Absolutely. Awesome, guys. Well, that is the entire bulk of the presentations. We're into Q&A now. Uh, I, I don't know if we have any questions. I don't see any. Um, so Corey and I, we'll just hang out for another minute or two uh, if any questions come in, but now is the time. Corey, is there anything throughout the presentation maybe we uh, could have touched on, do you think? I'm trying to just rack my brain if there's anything additional we can talk about. Um, I mean, I, I think, again, kind of the big takeaway is to make make video part of your everyday life, right? Like, you don't necessarily yeah. need to go out and spend all this money to be purchasing, you know, two and three and four, five thousand dollars. Like, you don't need all of that just to yeah. get started with things. Like Aaron said, to his point, Loom and uh, Wistia, Vidyard, these plenty of 
screen recording options out there for you to be able to easily just start producing video. And then as you start to take that on, you can kind of start to naturally level yourself up as those needs become greater, as your clients needs become greater, you can expand on things for there. But it's really just, it's making those baby steps, use what you got and just kind of, again, start making it part of your, your workflow. Just start making it as, as many things as you can put into video and it will, um, you'll find that you will grow quickly with it. Um, there's a lot of support yeah. in the community and definitely jump into the uh, study group. If you guys have any questions, if you want to ask questions, if you want feedback on things, for example, it's a really good place to um, kind of all come together. Mm -hmm.